good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to another episode of Voices for Excellence. I am your host, Dr. Michael Connor, CEO and founder of the Agile Evolutionary Group, but proud host of VFE. And today's guest, yes, she is one of the brilliant minds. She's waving high, one of the brilliant minds in education, and this is just going to be a complete geek out session. Uh, a good, good, good friend. Uh, whenever we get together, it's just a pure session. We 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 start off saying, "Hey, how you doing? How's everything?" And then we just go right into education theory, education research. I mean, it's just back and forth. And I am proud to have Dr. Renee Bryant. She is the director of plurilingual services for the Anaheim Union High School District in Anaheim, California, and also one of the proud hosts of, you see her background, the Ed Brandon podcast. It is a new podcast that just came out. Uh, her, as well as Miss Lynette White, are the hosts. It's such a divergent contrast, albeit, albeit is such, such, such an informational podcast for you um, from a professional learning standpoint and also just learning about branding. But uh, I can go on and on and on about Dr. Renee Bryant. But Dr. Bryant, it is good to have you on VFB. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Connor, for having me here on your Voices for Excellence podcast series. It is a great honor to be here with you. And I appreciate you having me early on this. I'm gonna call Tuesday morning, California time. So thank you so much. So excited to be here. Absolutely. Now to my audience out there, just to give you contact, uh, context with Dr. Bryant, right? Right now it is 10, 11 a.m., okay? She is recording this at 7, 11 a.m. California time. I tell you, that is a first for VFV to have some talent. <laughs> talent down at seven o'clock, just walking in. But you know what? I'm glad to have you on. Uh, it's going to be a semi geek out session, right? We're going to talk about your podcast, but also we're going to talk about education. We're going to talk about uh, historically excluded uh, student groups, but it's just going to be fun. Um, uh, my audience will get to hear the brilliance of Dr. Renee Bryant, but Let's just go right into our first question. And I am completely interested in this because Dr. Bryant, I know who, I know how you are. I know who you are. So I am looking forward to hearing your response to this. But when leaders, right, leaders across the country, when they listen to your podcast with Miss Lynette uh, White or education stakeholders in the Anaheim U uh, Union High School School District, when they unwrap, right, your leadership signature of who you are as a director, an excellence agent, right? What are these change makers when they engage with you and when they see your publications that you have generated? And I, I tell you, you know, the stuff that you have generated, Dr. Bryant, is absolutely amazing and to the point, right? But what song would they say would define you and your equity stance within the education ecosystem? Well, I have to tell you, Dr. Connor, I think this is the most difficult song you are a uh, question you asked me because it, I'm obsessed with music, as you can tell from our little pre talk with uh, Serena Reynolds uh, and dropping some uh, Oh Serena on her. So, uh, yes, I actually think I took the most time to really think about this because I always challenge uh, the the scholars, the doctoral candidates in my doctoral course to have a walk-on song, right? And it's that right. song that like like a baseball player walks onto the field, right, with their walk-on song. And so, um, yeah, I really have to think about this. And I'm going to be honest, I couldn't choose one. So here we go. Depending on the day. Disrupted. <laughs> all of the songs uh, could be my equity song. So I definitely had to call out Nina Simone and feeling good because we have to, in um, this walk that we're doing for equity and excellence, we have to keep a positive attitude. So feeling good, uh, Sam Cook, a change is going to come because we have to keep that positive uh, attitude. And then when it gets um, hard, 
uh, definitely some public enemy, fight the power, some bikini kill uh, with a rebel girl song. I, I went to Labyrinth uh, with All For Us because really we have to lead with love and to do this work, we have to be filled with love. And then the walk-on song that I always choose is either Bikini Kill, Rebel Girl, or Celia Cruz, Vidas Carnaval. And I love Surfaces. I hadn't heard this song. I guess it was um, in uh, one of those episodes with our coach and our soccer, you know, what is that show? Oh my gosh, I'm like, I haven't watched it in forever, but nevertheless, super, super positive song called Sunday Best. And so that like gets me totally hyped. And then I was like, okay, I can't leave Beyonce out. So I I called out uh, bigger. And when I feel like really like getting ah, and singing in the car, it's going to be yeah. spin around with Cupid. So I have like 10 songs, but yes. I think that really encapsulates um, how we feel a daily basis, right? We have all the feels from the love that we have to lead with to um, getting angry sometimes, but then having to back up and center ourselves and ground ourselves in a place of love again. So yeah, those are my 20, um, <laughs> 20, 20 songs, yeah. But Sorry. probably no one would think of, everyone's gonna think of the Santa Cruz because I always play it and, and probably Bikini Kill for uh, those college students that I teach, yeah. Dr. Bryant, that is awesome. And I can tell you, this is a first on VFE where we had, I counted three, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten different songs. But you know what? I, I I love that because each of those songs, they bring their independent theme to make this integrated or this conglomerate of a domain where we have to keep moving forward, right? Despite pitfalls, despite uh, barriers, despite you know, whether it be systems or 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 a, a bottleneck within the education model, we still have to continue to move forward. But I, I, I love the public enemy fight the power, right? <laughs> and that contrast between, you know, the love that we need to lead, but then also we got to fight the power uh, for our kids from an equity and excellence standpoint. So again, like I said, this was a, a, a first for VFV and small in one but that overarching macro theme is so important. And, it, and, and Dr. Bryant, that just kind of unwraps your expertise, right? Your intellectual property in this, uh, in this work and in this field, because you've participated in many different uh, high level and executive leadership programs across the country, right? One that we share in common, yes, the AASA Urban Soups Academy, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, theory, extraurdinary uh, methods of implementation, extraordinary leadership, just a, a, a leadership program, right, that you and I both are probably uh, proud graduates of. But with the collection of leadership programs that you have graduated from in the recent years, right, what are the major leadership themes you have learned and applied during these polarized, um, polarized times in the AC stage of education, right? How can leaders, how can they successfully navigate these turbulent times with strategies that you learned from some of the most prestigious programs here in the United States? Uh, thank you for this question. And when when I read it, I was like, yeah, I guess I have been in some academies. And uh, <laughs> I, I like to reflect, and you know, I'm a, a really firm believer in this, I, the concept of learning organizations, right? And they have to be made up of people who are continuously learning at all levels. So kind of people think like once you have a doctorate, you know, people that don't have a doctorate, they, maybe that's the end of your learning. You're done. You have, you know, reached the pinnacle. But really, it is just the beginning. I think you would agree with me that you learn a lot from a doctorate. And one of the things you learn for certain is that uh, how little you know, right? <laughs> that's right. Really exactly. the point. You don't know nothing, Jon Snow, right? So uh so attending academies is the way of forcing myself uh, to stay a student, right? To keep learning, expand my capacity and professional learning network, really for the benefit of my scholars, our fellow staff, families, and our community. So some major themes um, that I've learned of this, you know, number one, 
And I think we learn it every day, but it's emphasized in all the academies. And I think you would agree is uh, are the three R's, right? And not the three R's that maybe people think of, but the three R's of relationships, 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 right? And then I think a second thing that's been common through all the academies, which really is a reason why I want to speak to it, speak it out loud right now, is this idea of defining your core values and not just the words, but actually writing definitions of what they mean to you. And what does that look like in practice if you are actually practicing those core values on a daily basis? And then really considering those to be your North Star, uh, whichever way you look at it, right? The core of your being. And then um, this idea that if we want to make a larger difference um, systemically, we really need to be policy advocates. And so right now I'm in another academy. And this one I was recommended for. I didn't actually apply. It was just recommended by a board member from another district. And it is the Azusa Pacific University Next Generation Superintendents Cad Academy put on by um, some of the guys from Leadership Associates. And so uh, I was just attended this on Friday. And they really overemphasize this idea of, you know, all of us, not just when you get to the superintendent's level, but even the superintendent, um, he said, hey, I wish I really would have integrated myself earlier in this work. And that is the legislative work around education and really keeping up on policies and staying current, working with policy advocates and uh, knowing what policies are up for vote and working with the groups to see uh, this policy all the way through the ledge process. And I was really fortunate this past spring, California's Together contacted me. They are um, a California-based, obviously from the name, EL advocacy group that actually works all throughout the nation and um, intercontinental also. And um, they asked me to go and testify in front of the legislator for the state syllabi literacy and changing some of the requirements. And so it was kind of a softball, easy one, but I still was getting up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning, getting to the airport, flying to Sacramento for one day and then flying home the same day. <laughs> but it was amazing. And so I do highly recommend for people to um, get involved in policy making. And then I think you would agree with this, this idea of keep working on your emotional intelligence daily. Uh, we all have quote unquote triggers, right? And um, we all have varying degrees of trauma in our background. None of us are free from that. And so I think it's really important for all of us to work on our emotional intelligence. And um, that is a daily thing. And then with rapidly changing technology, we don't only also have our EQ, but um, just in that uh, superintendent seminar on Friday, they talked about the AQ, right? The adaptability quotient and how we have to be open to changing quickly and being able to adapt. And then I would say practicing mindfulness, the pause principle and uh, something that Harvard Business Review talked about in an article about adaptability quotient, and that is the deliberate calm, right? And that goes along with emotional intelligence and goes along with pausing. And so I know, uh, you know, I just finished a Stanford Ed Leaders program, so I thought I better mention that one. And so I highly recommend it. The first professor I had actually the privilege of learning from was like the Hi, Agriva, aka Huggy Rao, right from Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's the author of Market Rebels and Scaling Up Excellence, Getting more without settling for less. His class was extremely useful. I mean, it was right during the pandemic and he was taking us through how major corporations navigate huge uh, change successfully and sometimes from point of failure going to success. And so we looked at a case study, uh, the Blue Jet case study. And uh, what I really got from that was something that I was learning in other ways too, which is the idea of liberatory design, right? So we need to be going to those people who are most affected by the decisions that we are going to make to get their input. And so that case study was really great at how they, JetBlue, had a crisis, they failed, they were on you know, cloud nine, then had crisis and had to go back and actually ask everyone from the people who put the luggage in the plane you know, to uh, the stewardesses or flight attendants, to the pilots, every single person that they touched in the operations they got input from and then uh, how to navigate that. And, you know, from the early adopters to people who may be pushing back. And that was really, really useful because it was kind of like a formula and something that I think educators um, 
can learn from. So a Google uh, Blue Jet case study <laughs> and then learn, read all about it, read all about it, people. So yeah, I highly recommend the program as well as the ASA National Superintendents Academy programs like the Urban Soups Academy that both of us attended. You attended at Howard. I attended at USC. AXA here in California, we have the Association for California School Administrators, their academies. And obviously, I just talked about the uh, Azusa Pacific University Academy, but it's a lot of academies. But, you know, I, I do consider myself a, li a lifelong learner and talking about uh, the adaptability quotient. We have to keep learning. If we are not learning, we are going to fall behind and that's going to hurt our scholars, our staff, our families and communities. So keep learning, people, and modeling the way for others to keep learning. Uh, Dr. Bryant, I could tell you this, right? And uh, to my audience, now you can see why I love Dr. Renee Bryant, right? Is the ultimate, ultimate lifelong learner. When you talk about lifelong learning, when you talk about um, trying to be able to bring in different uh, industry practices, right? You you heard the whole the liberatory design. That aspect is from the business science world, where when they heard the case study, she unwrapped in this very high level manner. If you think about that, you can draw on the alignment or emulations to design thinking, right? That first step of design thinking is empathy. When you talk about liberatory design and put from the people at JetBlue, very, very well-known uh, and well-renowned case study, right? Uh, with regards to that, unwrap that. And I, I think that you touched upon a very, very critical point. And I apologize for looking down, Dr. Brian, as I'm referencing notes from you, uh, learning organizations, right? And I think that when we talk about this in education, um, we see the, we, we, we bring in the teaching, right? Because we're so operationalized to say, teaching and learning organizations. However, when we look at it, right, that continuous learning, that lifelong learning that you model on a consistent basis, Dr. Bryant, um, it's truly education entities and the education model is uh, a, a continuous aspect or this continuous uh, domain of new learning. And that's where we have to be able to challenge ourselves to, and I always say this nationally, we have to challenge ourselves, ourselves to learn, to relearn, to un or learn to unlearn to relearn, right? Um, I'm probably using those in an interchangeable manner. However, we have to be able to have this continuous aspect of learning. And I really love how you brought in the AQ. Now, that's new for a lot of people, right? Because we always talk about IQ and EQ. Then there's that element of BQ I like to bring in, behavior quotient. And then now, the I'm so glad you brought that in, which is so needed in the AC stage of education, which is the AQ, is that adaptability quotient. I want to be able to expand on that for my audience, right? Because when we talk about scaling best practices, when we talk about looking at you know different nodes, I like to say within the educational organizational design, for continuous learning and testing, we have to be able to uh, acquire this level of adaptability within our practices and expect the uncertainty and expect the volatility with our designs that there's not going to be, or there's a high degree or high chance that there won't be a binary answer. When we talk about AQ, right, what does that look like, Dr. Brian, especially now if we really truly want to concretize equity within our, our learning organizations? Yeah, um, so I think that just like the pandemic, you know, shown a light on inequities that already existed um, and showed a greater light for, you know, the necessity for emotional intelligence as um, people um, have heightened emotions around the pandemic and now uh, the board wars and culture wars. Um, it's really important that we think of those two things and that also the adaptability quotient. And it is looking at one, um, are we going to be continuous learners? It really Adaptability is about continuously learning um, and it is about stopping and pausing. It is about that deliberate calm that I mentioned before. 
Um, and it is about, you know, being open, right? So how open are we to, to the change? That's really what is it is about. So, um, and, and we know that most people, um, that the fear of change, um, just comes from like loss, right? Those stages of loss. And so, um, helping people to navigate that and grow their adaptability quotient. Um, I think it was Jerry Almendares on the Ed Branding podcast. He is a superintendent of Santa Ana Unified School District. He came on and talked about the hockey stick effect and how change is going to happen even more rapidly every 10 years. And so I think that's why this adaptability quotient along with emotional intelligence is so important right now because we have to help our people and maybe it's not so much our scholars because our scholars are so used to it but the staff around us and the families who are used to maybe slower progress like if you think about the progress because we're around the same age um you know the 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 change from like a landline existed when we both were alive right to the cell phone that was a long change but now you know i just saw this little meme of like everything from the Jetsons has come true. And it's like, that happened very rapidly, right? So for those of you that are very young, the Jetsons were a cartoon that had like Zoom before Zoom existed and had all these like Skyping and all these things, you know, like they were so futuristic and they lived in houses in the sky and they flew airplanes as cars. And so, yeah, this idea that change is happen happening rapidly and helping people um, to navigate that and to build. So just like our emotional intelligence can be built on a daily basis, um, our adaptability quotient can be also. So where some people, their first instinct is to become rigid maybe when change is gonna happen or to push back, that idea of deliberate calm is to stop and pause and then kick in that emotional intelligence and kick in an attitude of, openness from the universe right because we don't know what we don't know and to come with a state of curiosity and humility towards the change so uh in a nutshell that is what i consider adaptability quotient to be and why it's so important right now absolutely and dr bright um perfectly contextualized right uh, about the adaptability quotient i was thinking about or just referencing your hockey stick analogy, right? And the activity of change. And when I think of that specifically around technology, when we look at how we're integrating IoT, right? The uh, internet or um, the internet of things, or I, I believe is that, right? The IoT, artificial intelligence, right? Automation, when we think about the variants, right? The variants that are incorporated into whether it be the IoT, AI, or when we talk about automation, how that is changing or going to change the landscape of education, right? The emulation of moving from a landline to the cell phone, we're going to see that radicalization within the education model of how IoT, how AI, machine learning, automation, and even one thread that we continuously not to add in uh, big data and analytics, right? How that, how those are going to be the core drivers of what's really going to change the future of education. Uh, completely, completely right. Uh, the adaptability, that continuation of learning. And when you speak of that, listen, sister, don't be upset because <laughs> the, uh, leadership programs that you've been involved in, I've been involved in the same amount um, I, I I know when I went back to school, everybody's like, you know, what do you what do you have to accomplish by going back to school? Oh no, no, I want to learn about business analytics. I want to learn about you know how to be able to develop those models on the back end and what AI looks like, you know, from a standpoint of supervised algorithms to you know my c course creations that I did uh, when I was at MIT and unwrapping you know business design and algorithmic thinking. Um, I, I get it, Dr. Bryant, that continuous aspects of learning. Uh, truly, truly appreciate it. But now I want to get down to your education expertise because you are definitely a unicorn, Dr. Bryant. Uh, you bring it in, you know, the business science world, bringing in practices from 
uh, computer science, but I want to get down to your level of expertise with regards to education because they need to hear this from you, right? And you're considered one of the national experts with regards to EL education and services. But also what people don't know is you are a co-author as well. Yay, right? For the book, Radically Inclusive Teaching with New Emergent Plurilingual Students. You're going to have to unwrap that because that's that's a new word in context in education, right? But what are the essential, before we even get into that, what are the essential themes and the key takeaways or the critical takeaways from the book that you co-authored? Yeah, so thank you for that. And and I'm going to go back to our last topic real fast and just say this. Um, since this, I'm you are you are so your reach is international, right? And so you have a lot of listeners that maybe aren't educators. So to just over clarify, education has a really hard time adapting. So I just want to say that the adaptability quotient is something that educational organizations as learning organizations will have to embrace very quickly or as they say go the way of the dinosaur so i do want to say i'm really proud of anaheim union high school district where i do work as a director of plurilingual services i'm super proud of our board of trustees and our superintendent michael matsuda uh, we already have an artificial intelligence pathway at one of our high schools we have a board resolution supporting uh, integrating artificial intelligence into all of the content areas, just like we do our integrated English language development standards, um, emotional intelligence, mindfulness. And so I think um, I, I do believe, and not because I work here, but I really do believe that Anaheim Union High School District is a model for the nation for the adaptability quotient. Our superintendent is always uh, working with the business sector, with university sector, and really trying to figure out. He comes from a business background. He didn't actually enter education uh, until like that was a second stage of life career for him. And he rose really fast from teacher, teacher leader, coordinator to get this, the superintendent. So he is also a political um, uh, savant, right? So we'll land that shark, savant, we'll put it in a positive uh, uh, language, right? So um so yeah, uh, we're really lucky to have him leading us. We're really lucky to have the board of trustees that trust the vision. And um, yeah, and I think little by little, as we work with our educators, right? We did an AI conference two years ago and it kind of fell on deaf ears. I mean, the business sector loved it um, and our city loved it. And kind of the teachers were like, yeah, like why did we spend that money? And, and that's okay because that's from a place of of um, that fear of change, right? That kind of like, I don't really understand this yet. And that's on us, right? Because we maybe needed to build background and context more. But let me tell you, when chat GPT hit, everyone's like, oh, ooh, look at Anaheim Union, you know, they rolled out AI conference and ooh, AI is important, you know? So kudos again to our superintendent board of trustees and our leadership. So going now back to your question about our book, yeah, super proud. Uh, the book is centered around the work that we've done at Anaheim Union High School district increase and it's really increasing access equity and success for our newcomers so those that are new to the united states meaning they have been here less than one year less than 12 months and emergent plural lingual scholars um in partnership with two professors from cal state university fullerton uh the co-authors they are really the main authors i'm a little like side author uh, but dr allison dover and uh, dr Ferran rodriguez vise and so the they are the co-authors of the book, and they were also the co-authors of the curriculum that I'm going to talk about. So the essential themes of the book of radically inclusive teaching are viewing newcomer scholars from an asset-based lens and recognizing the funds of knowledge that these scholars come with to the United States, seeing newcomer scholars as emergent plural lingual scholars who should be empowered to bring their whole selves including all of their languages into the classroom and honor that, you know, we in California had this proposition 227 that existed from the late 90s until just a few years ago. So it was uh, kind of repealed or turned over by the new proposition, Proposition 58, that California's together that I mentioned earlier and GABE, the California Association for Bilingual Educators, worked really hard to pass. And that did away. So Prop 227 was an English only initiative. 
Um, and um, it did a lot of damage in our state. So it reinforced this idea of solamente hablan en, en, en inglés, hija, se porta bien mía, solamente habla inglés. You know, this kind of thing that our, you know, our parents, they were hit by rulers back in the day, believe it or not, you know, for speaking Spanish. They were told not to speak their language. And so this proposition really moved to a place of honoring language, um, increasing dual language immersion program, world language, heritage language, and seeing those as the assets that they truly are. But this is a work, right? Because our parents were convinced that, no, 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 the best way to learn English is to speak English only, where we know that the research is that our scholars had their their bra their brains are malleable and flexible, and they learn two languages at once, and it makes them even smarter than we are, right? So um, yes, this book touches on that. And then um, it's also uh, based on some work done by our co-educators. So it's really, we worked with the professors back in 2015, there was some pushback. We had recent immigrants from the Middle East and um, those advocates were saying, hey, what are you doing for our scholars? They're struggling, they're sinking. And so we worked with these professors to author and plan out and design the Summer Language Academy. And so it's four weeks, four days a week. It has, then it had two co-educators in it. Now it has four co-educators because now we have uh, Cal State Fullerton pre-intern teachers and then we have this, okay, listen, everybody, we have our Anaheim Innovative Mentoring Experience rising seniors that are interns in the program. We have bilingual seniors that want to be teachers in that program and in the summer co-teaching with these educators. And the classes are about 25 newcomers each. And it, the, the content really in the book focuses on that content of seeing yourself, your identity, that's an asset that you bring to the United States and the languages that you bring are assets and then seeing the power in that place. So you come with power and you can make. So we actually integrate research because this is and if no one gets anything else from this time with you with me, it's this just because someone comes with a different language does not mean they don't know the content. They just don't know English. So if you went to Pakistan, you don't hear content, you just don't know Pashto. Does that mean you're, you are ignorant? No, it just means that you need to learn that language, but you can learn content and language simultaneously. So we need to honor the fact that these scholars, most of them, I would say 90% of them come with the content. And there are scholars with interrupted formal education and there's work that we do to catch them up, but we need to honor those scholars that are coming with so much language from their home countries. And so that's what this is about. The book is all about that. It highlights our educators, their work. It highlights our scholars. Our scholars' work is published in the book. I'm, and then like my little chapter is about the systems work. So we have found that the professors have tried to recreate this in other districts. And the missing element, they would say, oh, it's the Bryant element. And it's like, no, it's not the Bryant element. It's just that people need to understand. They understand the pedagogy, but now they need to understand what systems you have to have in place from the district level to support these types of programs. And so as a result, we now have Saturday Language Academy. So happy that one of our board members, Al Jabbar, he's since you know moved on to a different arena. But uh, he said at the time, like, that's not enough, Renee, the Summer Language Academy. I'm like, I know, what should we do? And so let's do a Saturday Language Academy. Okay, let's do it, right? And then Project Learn is something, a Spencer Foundation a grant funded project we have with Cal State Fullerton, where they gave us about $500,000 to build the capacity of many more teachers. So this idea of tr uh, like train the trainers type of model and really integrating it system wide. So we're, they're going back and talking within their department chair meetings and really building the capacity of others. And so, yeah, this book, it serves to help educators build the capacity to better serve and empower our scholars as well as empower district leaders to lead the work from a systems approach. That's okay. what the book's about. Super proud of it. Amazing, Dr. Bryant. And I can tell you this, right, with your book to my audience, please get it, right? And uh, the individuals or the uh, researchers that Dr. Bryant worked with, those are, I mean, those individuals are who, who, uh, who's who essentially in education. But 
I, I love the approach, Dr. Brian, of taking it from an asset-based lens, right? Our current secretary right now, Dr. Miguel Cardona, I remember him saying bilingualism is a superpower, right? But I'm going to change the word now, plurilingualism, and you're going to right. <laughs> as well. But um, the language that you bring, right, that is, if you think about the approach that you take, that you took within the book, and then also what you're underscoring in Anaheim, uh, that's equity and excellence. And by definition, innovation with regards to the systems approach and the systems design, and not just concentrating just linear on the pedagogical aspect of it. There a lot of, I like to say, a lot of uh, organizational misnomers in the context of design occurs because we have to think much broadly with the systems lens and then looking at, you know, you have to take in consideration the subsystems that exist within the architecture or within the structures of education. But for you to be able to create those programs, when we think about the Summer Language Academy or the Saturday Language Academy and then the Project Learn uh, collaboration with Cal State Fullerton, unbelievable. That is innovation by design. That is bringing in this divergent uh, divergent entities, traditional education um, um, vertical, I like to say, business vertical, bringing that and bringing programs alive with that. But really, really, really appreciate your whole systems approach. But now we really want to get into that systems approach, specifically around, it, to you and I, this might not be a new word, but uh, within the education sector, yes, this is a new word, a uh, new word plurilingualism, right? Not really used much in context, even in the East Coast, I can speak about. But let's go back to your role within the Anaheim, Uni uh, Anaheim Union High School school, uh, school District, right? Director of Prolingual Services. Now, before we even get to, to itself, unwrap that new word, right? Because when we think about that new word, specifically in context, specifically when we think about roles and responsibilities and practice, right? We're probably going to start seeing prolingual uh, use in context throughout the country. What is that specifically? Bilingual? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there's a little history behind all this. So um, back in the day when I first started, our scholars that came with another language were, were called limited English proficient students. Okay. And so that is a deficit mindset and how we um, titled our scholars, right? And so then we moved to uh, English language learner. We thought that was better. Um, and that in California, we called it like the blue book, you know, <laughs> like there was this CDE blue book and it had all the researchers say English language learner. And so we all said English language learner. And uh, then someone said, OK, well, let's let's cut out the language part. Let's make them an E.L., an English learner. That's way better. And so we're all like, oh, let's do that. And so um, and I was still a classroom teacher at that point. Right. So then kind of as the pendulum swinging and as uh, we're moving and focusing on equity and as I would say Californians together is doing a lot of work nationally, we start looking at, OK, by literacy. Like uh, our uh, let's bilingual students are bilingual. Let's honor the fact they come with another language. And so that's another term. And that's even more asset based. Right. And then we say, OK, well, maybe uh, some of them come with their indigenous language. They come with Spanish. They come with English, some English. OK, they're multilingual. So I was really proud. You know, I inherited a department called uh it was English learner and multilingual services. And I was like, oh, you know, I came from a department that I named the, the Office of Language Acquisition after Sandy, right? At San Diego Unified. And so um, I was working with the professors. They had just given me um, their kind of like the draft of their book. And they're like, okay, we want you to add this, we want you to, you know, read through. And so I kept seeing this term, plurilingual. And so before that, I was so proud of myself. I'm like, I know what I'm going to do because I don't have a deficit mindset. I'm going to remove English learner from the title of our department. And we're going to be multilingual services. That'll be so cute because it'd be like Ms. multilingual services. <laughs> so MS. And so uh, so then I read their book and I see plurilingual, plurilingual, plurilingual. I call we're in a project learn uh, the first year of it with 10 pilot educators, a little seminar. And I call Ferran over. Hey, Fred, like, I see that you're using this term, plurilingual. Do I need to 
I had just got 500 business cards made too, right? I'm like, do I change the name of the department? He's all, he just nodded his head, yes. I'm like, ah, uh, okay. And I just decided to rip the band-aid off and just go for it. I was like, I told like my super Italian, I work changing the name of the department to Floral Lingual Services. That's it. Yes, that's it. And so everyone's like, okay. Uh, how do you say it and what does it mean? And so, you know, first like the phonetical, plurilingual, 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 right? So once you get used to saying it, so the meeting is really about honoring translanguaging, right? So multilingual is like, I speak some Korean, I speak some Vietnamese, I speak a lot of Spanish and I speak a lot of English. Uh, so I'm multilingual and I silo those languages and that's multilingualism. And then plurilingual is like the plurilingualism that happens in that we don't stay in one language. I know you know Spanish and I've heard you go in and out of uh, English and Spanish in a conversation. I, Lynette as well, she's a fluent Spanish speaker, a co-author co and co-podcaster. And so depending on the word is really what language you're gonna use because people that are, are multilingual, plural lingual, uh, they know that a word in English and a word in Spanish, it doesn't have a direct uh, translation. So a an example of that is ganas, right? So if you have ganas, there is not a direct translation. It's like words and words and words. And it doesn't still capture what ganas is, right? And so it's important that we, that we empower, not allow. We don't say allow because that means that we have, that we are, in no. We are co-creating, we are co-educators with our scholars. We learn from them. So we're empowering them to bring their whole selves, their whole identity, all of their languages, and to go in and out of language and use language. So that equally, because there shouldn't be a hierarchy of language in our classrooms. And we know from the research that being able to access your primary language Language will uh, create transference in the new language. So you actually learn more. Students or scholars will learn more if they are empowered to go in and out of language. So that is really what um, plurilingualism is all about, is empowering people, all people to go in and out of language and use language as appropriate as they see. And, and so maybe in other states, this isn't such a big deal, but in California it is because like I said, um, almost 20 years we suffered, or I guess it was more than 20 years, we suffered uh, with the UNS initiative, with Prop 227, and that really, you know, this English-only environment. So Californians uh, together, they like to say that Pro uh, Proposition 58 that passed in 2016, when we know something else had happened, um, that it was a miracle, and it's also, uh, it was very popular because we know there is the gentrification of dual language immersion. We know that Trump's grandchildren, they are plurilingual and they speak Mandarin and English. So uh, having the assets of another language, we know creates greater opportunities. And so it defies all party lines. And so Proposition 58 in California uh, passed with a higher margin than we like to say the marijuana initiative. So kudos to the California uh, voters who made sure that we can implement more dual language immersion programs without having to have parents sign waivers, waving away the rights to English only instruction and things like that. So that was a lot, but that's plural lingualism. <laughs> oh, no, my uh, great explanation, great definition, right? Because I think A1 uh, when we uh, look at prolingualism, uh, that is, I think, the step up when I look at it from this equity stance, right, of how we're truly creating environments for all, right? The intentionality uh, behind the work, right, behind the responsibility of the delts, right, behind the... Um, advocating when we think about moving Prop 227 and Prop uh, 58 that was signed in 2016, but also now supporting uh, the work with that. That's just absolutely phenomenal, right? So, but I want to get, uh, we created level set because I wanted, you know, uh, the, I wanted to ensure that there was a level set definition of what prolingualism is and what that means in context, right? But now I want to take it to the second part since we got the level set definition already established, right? 
So now with this level of prolingualism, the work that is uh, embedded in it, right? When we unpack the work specifically now, moving towards this whole equity and excellence stance with regards to prolingualism and the services that you, you uh, provide, now, going back to your grounded level of expertise around organizational design, right? How does this look in the context of a systems level design that, as you stated from the last question, right, or your last response, is moving beyond just pedagogical approaches or this, ped uh, this pedagogy outlook that is just sometimes linear but exacerbates opportunity and access gaps within our learning organization? So, what does that look like now from a design perspective and a design feature for outputs with a new business model? Yeah, well, I'm really fortunate, as I mentioned before, you know, the Anaheim Union High School District Board of Trustees and our superintendent, Michael Matsuda, they have always prioritized equity, access, and success for our plural lingual scholars. It has always been, I mean, our superintendent's been recognized for it. He actually was one of um, I think the second group of Education Week leaders to learn from for his work, prioritizing um, the needs of what we used to call long-term English learners, but now uh, our plural lingual scholars who are on a longer journey, right? And that's okay. Um, but yes, definitely recognize. So I'm lucky that when I came here, it was one of the reasons why I decided to come here. Uh, Summer Language Academy had just been started. Um, I knew he supported the work. He recruited me, asked me to come to here, and I knew um, that it was a priority and equity was a priority. So I'm lucky. That's always been uh, a priority in a systems uh, viewpoint. Uh, so just so people have some context, we are a seventh through 12th grade district. Uh, we serve about 28,000 students, so scholars uh, across five different cities with five different elementary school districts feeding into us. Um, the attainment of the pathways to biliteracy in eighth grade and then the state seal of biliteracy, which all states except um, South Dakota <laughs> have uh, adopted. So all the states, the United States, have South Dakota, a little pressure on you there, South Dakota. Uh, but yes, the seal of uh, the seal of biliteracy in 12th grade. It's a priority um, and it's called out within uh, what our superintendent has designed. It's called the Career Preparedness Systems Framework, CPSF for Anaheim Union High School District. So when we talk about systems and not silos, that is actually one of our core values as well. It is actually named. We have nine core values and systems, not silos, is one of those core values. So our leadership, they understand the importance of biliteracy, triliteracy, plural literacy, we offer eight different world languages um, across 22 different campuses. We offer dual language immersion at seven campuses we, where we just implemented a new one this year at a junior high, two full classes. That's a testament. People crave this and it's not enough. So another thing, like another tidbit to leave with, especially East Coast people, uh, we have a lot of dual language immersion uh, programs being implemented. And people are like, that's so cute for elementary. Oh, K-6 dual. They're totally proficient. They don't need it in seventh grade. That's it. Yay. Okay. No. And this is why. Just hear me out, people. Because we don't have our scholars stop taking English in seventh grade. We don't. St oh, they've taken it for K-6. So why don't we just stop it? Well, we don't. We don't have them stop taking science or math or history. Well, Language is the same way. We want our scholars to be grade level, content level, job preparedness, vocabulary ready at grade level. So by this dual language immersion really should be a pre-K, so preschool all the way to 12th grade program. That's my little commercial for dual language. If you need to know more, you just email me because it can be done. We've done it here. We uh, implemented Vietnamese dual language immersion in 2019 without a feeder elementary coming to us. And so one of the ways that we did this is by assessing scholars into the program. And that's the thing, especially in New York, especially East Coast, you have plural lingual scholars everywhere. You have a lot of newcomers. And those are the scholars who can be stars in your dual language immersion program. So assess them in, give them access. A lot of old research, and I love Thomas and Collier. They are amazing researchers. And they would say, oh, you can't have a scholar enter dual language immersion uh, beyond K-1. But that's that we've we've proven that that is not true. You can. 
You just need to see the assets that they're bringing if they're coming new to the country. The other thing, we have scholars that take Spanish catechism, Korean catechism, Vietnamese catechism. I'm sorry, if you can understand the Bible in another language, you can do okay in dual language immersion. So those scholars should be in. Our scholars that are in weekend language and culture school, and there's a lot of those because when people came here and they couldn't get access to their language in public schools, they created their own schools on the weekend. So we can assess those scholars and bring them in. And it's not a competition. It is adding value. So there's my little commercial for that. So uh, we actually will be also. So I want to give a little credit to the elementary school district that the biggest one that feeds into us. So uh, they had some parent advocates, one, Dr. Jose uh, Moreno, who is a professor at Cal State Long Beach, who was on city council, his wife, Lorena Moreno, who's now a principal for us. But they were uh, the flagship parents, the parents who advocated when Prop 227 was still in effect, meaning English only was in effect, they went and they advocated. They got the signatures and they started dual language immersion at the elementary school. So we've had our secondary dual language immersion in Spanish for a decade. It's right. award winning. It got the Cabe Seal of Excellence. We've gotten the California School Board Association Golden Bell for our programs. We have we actually have this. We have a district from Boston come and visit us last year. We've had districts from Minnesota, like all over the nation, come and visit because people kind of get this idea like it can't be done, but it, it it can be. So in 2025, we'll implement another high school dual language Spanish dual language immersion program, and then in 2026, we're actually going to uh, implement Korean dual language, and this has to do with our feeder elementary. So when our feeder elementary. Um, hired their new superintendent, Dr. Chris Downey. He is a graduate from USC. Um, he was, you know, asked by the board, we would like you to implement dual language immersion at every single one of the sites. We feel that this is an equity issue. And so kudos to that board made up of four of our Anaheim Union High School District teachers at the time. <laughs> so that's another little thing, like get your teachers to run for school board if you want things enacted, right? So, um, yeah, so he did it. He had this great uh, coordinator, Magali Rodriguez. They enacted in one year, they opened a strand of dual language immersion at every single one of their sites. The next year, they offered Korean dual language immersion the same year that we offered Viet. So that's why in a few years, we're going to have Korean dual language immersion, a real Korean dual language immersion. And the definition, I know that I'm getting like in the weeds with my passionate plurilingualism, but just so people know, you can't just offer AP Spanish and say, I have a dual language immersion program at secondary. No, you don't. Like you have to at least offer two courses in the target language, two courses. So you will offer AP Spanish. Okay. What's your second course? Once you offer two courses, you're good. Here at Anaheim for junior high, we offer three courses in the target language, uh, depending on the site, depending on the teacher credentialing, right? Sometimes it's history, science, and then the Spanish for Spanish speakers or some other uh, content. For our Vietnamese dual language immersion, you talk about me being a unicorn. We had a unicorn, Dr. Connor. We had a teacher who had um, a Vietnamese V-clad. She had a computer science uh, credential and she had the CTE credential. So we created a pathway around her skills and uh, it is uh, a partnership with Amazon. It's computer science embedded. And we are so proud of that. So going back real quick, again, our core values are systems, not silos. We work really hard to make sure that we're not siloed. And some of the system pieces that other districts can learn from us is we have a district uh, plurilingual task force. We have site plurilingual task forces. So we cut, we have district recommendations and we meet with our sites uh, twice a year. Uh, we also have a newcomer task force, a dual language immersion task force leads. We meet four times with all of our dual language immersion staff. We have EL, PL program chairs, PL, EL counselors, DLI site coordinators. And we consider that all of these teacher leaders, these site leaders, system leaders, they do have a seat at the table. So that is how we, and again, credit to some people that came before me too, because some of these systems I inherited. So kudos to Cynthia Vasquez Pettit, who was the first director in this seat. And that's how we go about having systems and not silos. I'll, I'll tell you this, Dr. Bryant, you gave a, a practitioner's simplified definition of creating uh, organizational coherence, vertical alignment with the systems, where now 
uh, historically, right? We always see in education when you just purely just do, I like to say, a business a business scan or a, a business logic scan on your systems, right? You see that they are inherently siloed and very hard to move to this level of adaptability, i.e. a Q, so that now your systems are, I like to say, cross-functional and, inter and interdependent by design, right? You created that archetype where now it challenges the traditional nodes of siloed systems where you have an archetype that's featured with coherence and interdependency. Wow, 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 Dr. Brian. See, I'm looking at it from a theoretical sense. I'm looking at it from broad organizational design. I'm right in here. Oh, archetype. Okay, public education leadership project. Um, moving towards vertical alignment, coherence. Phase process of design and implementation two to three years out. More importantly, moving away from the silo systems where now you're using the voice i.e. all your multiple task force where now you're looking at prolingualism, right? And being intentional with the organizational design and that continuous learning. Dr. Brian, now everybody can see why I love talking to you, right? <laughs> but now on a fun question. And I'm a fan, I'm a fan, I'm gonna say, I'm a fan the Ed Branded Podcast. Yes. Uh, Miss Lynette White and, and yourself, Dr. Bryant, you are doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job with the launch of that. I'm telling you, the guests that you had up there, uh, some future guests, previous guests, uh, I listen in. I can tell you, I listen in. And uh, thank you for having me as one of your guests on the Ed Brandon podcast. But for my audience, right, if I'm a newcomer, who is trying to elevate my voice, right? Because you guys do an amazing job with branding. And I'm trying to elevate my voice for all. And if, or if I'm an education stakeholder, even if I'm established in the field, I want to expand nationally because I want to be able to have this leverage or have this platform of impact. But for someone that doesn't know where do I start? And how do I strengthen my own individual and even collective network effect for broader impact in education? Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, one, I want to say that everyone agrees that your episode of the Ed Brandam podcast was a masterclass. So congratulations. Um, I know people were really excited and learned a lot from you. So we really do appreciate you lending your voice and expertise to the podcast. And um yeah, I mean, you're doing it too, right? You have your podcast. So we're in uh, a place where uh, people can become the media. So Noam Chomsky talked about this. He wrote a book about becoming the media. That was back in the 90s. That was when like everyone decided like, I'm going to start a zine, right? And so uh, that's even more so now. Like we know, unfor like however you view this, fortunately or unfortunately, um, a little more of the death of print media. And that might be good uh, for our environment, right? Um, and still, uh, all of this technology allows us to, um, you know, you're now what would be like you're uh, a host, right? <laughs> you you have your own like, it's like a little television show, right? And so we have greater access. And so, yeah, I think um, one, um, you know, starting podcast, being deep in the community. Um, as you know, we have a book tentatively called um, Ed Branding, self Sight and Organization, Amplifying Connections, Voices, and Stories. It'll be published in 2024 uh, by New York Times bestselling author Dave Burgess on DPC Inc. And uh, he really, when we interviewed him recently, gave some good advice. So people listen to that episode if you are interested in how to publish a book, if you're interested in how to grow your network. Uh, he gave some advice. Again, we're going to include it in like the little margins, right? We'll include some of your quotes too. And that is if you want to strengthen your network for a broader impact, uh, become an authentic and active part of the community you want to network with, right? And so I see you doing that. Uh, the people who are really successful, they're doing it, they're in it, uh, they're calendaring time. Um, you know, they are commenting, liking, sharing what others are doing. Um, and this idea of like, if you want your voice elevated, even if it is for the benefit of your scholars, start elevating the voices of others. 
Um, some people, you know, we get into the starvation mindset, like there's only enough cheese for me. No, there's a lot of cheese. Actually, there's a whole mountain with governmental cheese. So forget it, let it go and, you know, start sharing, you know, and, and sometimes women can be the worst about this. You know, we are not each other's uh, competition. That is something created <laughs> by, uh, the patriarchy. <laughs> they sat around and they created it. So, and we gave into it. So, uh, we need to uplift each other, uh, uplift our brothers, and we need to just keep sharing and not hoard knowledge, not hoard information, uplift each other. And I think that's another way uh, that people can be seen as being authentic in the community is celebrating other people. I think that uh, this is hard, but we need to calendar that time. If it's not like, you know, if it's not on your calendar, it doesn't exist. So we have to calendar that time uh, to add value, to share of others. And so I was really glad that you asked this question because uh, for for me, the book is also a political book because um, we know we're in the culture wars right now. There's a group within the United States that is trying to erode the promise and the power of public education. Everyone believes uh, that the power of public education is to strengthen our democracy and we must. So everyone that believes that must do their part to spread the successful story. Uh, we have to counter this extreme narrative that's created by those to seek to destroy public education and our democracy because there are fascists in our country and they do want to destroy our democracy. So we cannot allow what I call a death by a thousand cuts. You know, we cannot allow that. We have to do our part to be sure the public understands how incredible necessary public schools are. So our book, yes, it's about branding and and it's about leadership, and it's also to empower you to fight the power to fight these people. Like you know, this is where I get my public enemy song going. Because no, we're not going to let the little power that the racists have in our country, that the fascists have. No, we're going to fight that power for sure, and we are going to win. Because you know, I think about uh, our history, and there's no way. Like we have gone, we have persevered. We, we we will not allow this to happen in our country. So yes, our book is to empower people to identify, amplify their personal brand, site, organization brand, and it's for the benefit of our scholars, staff, and families and community, as well as I think that our book is for the benefit of our public schools and our democracy. I'm out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to go there. Listen. <laughs> And sis, you already know in our conversations, I you get me amped up, right? You get <laughs> baby, you get me ready, stand right beside you in this fight because um, like I said, the the intellectual property that you bring into the uh education ecosystem, coupled with your vitality advocacy with regards to uh leveraging equity and excellence for all, how can they not stand next to you? Uh, in this fight the power. We got to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I love you to death, sis. But last question, right? Last question. But going back to the past, the previous question, I love, uh, listen, I love what you said. I love what you said. You know what you said? Everybody got the cheese. Everybody can have some, right? We're not hoarding it. Everybody can have some. I love that about you, Renee. But <laughs> <laughs> last question. You made it through VFV, sis. There you go, Renee. You made it through, right? Right, there it is. But last question, last question. What three words, only three, and yes, Dr. Connor is limiting Dr. Brian to three words, but if you know in previous uh, episodes, nobody's limited to three words on this question, but I'm just going to state how it is, right? <laughs> what three words do you want today's audience to leave our episode with regarding achieving what we talked about the whole episode, the whole show, excellence and equity with historically excluded students as we continue in this trajectory to Delta 2030. Okay, I'll make this fast because it's more than three words. So my first word is love. So U.S. Army General uh, John H. Stanford is quoted in the Kuzis and Posner's seminal work the leadership challenge. The secret to success is to stay in love, love the people, love the work, stay in love with achieving excellence and equity. So the first word is love. 
The second word is courage. Courage isn't simply one of the values, but the form of every virtue uh, at the testing point. It's a quote uh, from uh, a book. So first we need love. Second, we need courage. We need courage to live by our core values. Core values are easy to live by when they're convenient. There are points like when a local district kicked um, our state superintendent, Tony Thurman, out of their board meeting that I feel appalled, angry, and heartbroken about attacks on public education. Then I remember the courage that it took to desegregate schools. We all know that we have de facto uh, segregation and real segregation in parts of the South. And still, it took courage to fight uh, for civil rights. People with great courage lost their lives. So when I ground myself back in the history of courage and education, that I'm not appalled, angry, or heartbroken. I feel resolute in my call to courageous transformational leadership. My third word is significance. Seth Godin's new book, The Song of Significance, uh, says significance isn't getting, uh, isn't what we get. Significance is what we do for others. So keep living in your purpose and significance. Keep doing this hard work. This work is based in love and courage to create greater excellence and equity for our historically excluded scholars. And I wanna end with one of my favorite Martin Luther King quotes, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. So our scholars deserve love, courage, significance to demand. They need to demand. So we have to empower them to demand equity, access and, uh, and opportunity. Demand them, empower them to do the same. Amazing, Dr. Brian. Um, I'm gonna contextualize the three words, love, courage, and significance. Love how you unwrap the core values, but the purpose of keep doing the hard work each and every day. Empower demand, empower demand, right? Uh, working in reciprocity with each other. But Dr. Bryant, you lasted. You made it through VF. <laughs> hey, listen, if my audience want to get in contact with you, really expand on what prolingualism is, how to integrate that into a successful design, but more importantly about your books and your book that's coming out, the Ed Branding Podcast, how would they be able to get in contact with you? Yeah, they can message me on Twitter. Follow me at, at Dr. D R R E N A E B R Y A N T. So Renee Bryant, like Kobe, but A E, like uh, different than the French spelling. And then uh, same with Instagram, same with LinkedIn and Facebook, all those things. Happy to be a partner in this work with you, just to connect with you. Um, my word, right? My my word, my brand is connection, and that's based on love. So I love connecting with people and um, just to live in love with people. So um, yeah, and then Renee.Bryant at Laverne.edu, but hopefully you can put that all in the show notes. So that'll be that. And thank you, Dr. Michael Connor. I know that we went over in time, so feel free to edit out anything I said. I will completely understand. And just thank you for your time. I enjoyed having this conversation. I appreciate you and the work that you're doing. And I have your book right here. So here we go. And I'll post my picture with it. Oh, I have to have it in front of my face. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much and don't leave because I want to take a screenshot. So don't leave right away. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Thank you for your support and thank you for being uh, a guest on BFB. I'll tell you this, right? Uh, my audience will learn a lot. will learn a lot from you today. I wrote down and you know how analytical I am. I wrote down 15 different education researchers uh, and also in the business world that you listed. So to my audience, an asynchronous platform for direct instruction, rewind this episode, please. Dr. Bryant, thank you so much. And on that note, onward and upward, everybody. Have a great evening. <laughs>